All right, y'all, we are back with another video. And today, it seems like Ashton Kutcher has been in the news lately. Like, this right here just kind of resurfaced. I've been hearing everybody's talking about it. And I'm like, what in the world is going on with Ashton Kutcher? Now, this one, this uh, video right here is coming from uh, the channel Patrick CC. He does a great job over there. I will leave a link in the description. That way, y'all can go watch this original video. But this right here is called The Leak Letter. Ashton Kutcher never wanted us to read. Now, I don't know a lot about this, but I uh, I had heard something uh, on the internet today because, like I said, a lot of people was talking about it about uh, from this '70s show that uh, this guy named Danny Masterson. Now, like I said, uh, I never really watched the '70s show like that, so I don't really know like uh, all the people you know. You know, there was actors on there, but they said that Danny Masterson just got 30 years in prison for something he did over 20 years ago say he r-worded like two women and it and, and, and i don't know like i said y'all uh they've been saying something about that ashton kutcher like was like saying that this man is his role model and all type of stuff and then they said that he uh ashton kutcher came back out and apologized to his fans for calling danny masterson a role model after he'd been convicted of a uh, R word and two women back in the early 2000s. Now, like I said, this right here just surfaced, so I don't really know all the details, but I've been hearing people talk about it, I've been coming across my timeline. I'm like, man, this is crazy. But if y'all know more about that, please let me know. Like I said, uh, make sure y'all hit that like button, subscribe to the channel. Shout out to everybody showing so much support. Everybody that's been leaving positive comments in the comments section. And I also want to thank everybody that clicked on this video for the very first time. Like I said, y'all, this right here was just out of the blue. I'm like, what the world is everybody talking about with Ashton Kutcher? And then come to find out this right here was what it's all about, saying that a video didn't resurface that everybody is talking about right now. So uh, let's dive straight into this video and let's see exactly what's going on. But uh, let's go, y'all. 19-year-old Ashton Kutcher walked on the set of That 70s Show as Kelso and the world fell in love with him. He was a tall, handsome, gullible goofball who stole the hearts of women and teens around the world. What they didn't know is that there is a whole different side of the actor that Hollywood rarely sees. And over the years, he would slowly expose who he truly is. Debuting in August 1998, That 70s Show followed the Foreman family, mainly through the eyes of their son Eric, and his group of teenage friends, pretty boy Michael Kelso, stoner Stephen Hyde, and foreign exchange student Fez, along with the Foreman's neighbor, Donna Pinciotti, and snobby rich girl, Jackie Burkhart. Although a comedy, the show addressed issues universal to teens across all decades, including relationship drama, problems with school, and underage drinking and substance abuse. Despite the near-constant bickering and sarcastic jokes, each friend deeply cared for one another. Two people that especially cared for each other were Jackie and Kelso, who were boyfriend and girlfriend on the show. And in season one, episode five, they kissed in front of 10 million viewers. At the time, Ashton was 19 and Mila Kunis was just 14 years old. She was 14 when what we started the, the show. I was like 19, right? Right. And they're like, okay, you guys are gonna be making out in this scene. Oh, and I'm like no. thinking like, wait, I this is like slightly illegal, right? I was gonna illegal, say, that's right? probably your first kiss ever, right? It was my first kiss. Why is someone oh. bet you made with Danny about our first kiss? No, it wasn't the first kiss. <laughs> no, it was like a second Ashton. or third kiss. It was the first, it was like the first week. No, it was not the first week. Whatever, let me tell you what All happened. Right, no, let no, me tell no, you what happened. No, no, okay, yeah. so I've never kissed yeah. a guy. So okay. I, was, I was so, I mean, you know, Ash was attractive and yeah. I was a 14-year-old little girl and I was extremely scared for my life. Sure. And then, well, he, he was very nice about it. He was like, oh, don't worry. So I was like, okay. <laughs> then Danny goes and goes, dude, I'll give you $10 if you French kiss her. Why wouldn't you stick my stick your tongue in $10? my mouth? Ten dollars? What? No, 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 no. For ten dollars. You're making it sound like it was like really. Uh, it, okay, Dan, we had a little side bet, yeah, don't we? Yeah. In multiple interviews throughout her career, Mila states oh, that she no. was scared, as most of us were, for her first kiss. Twenty-five years ago, people thought this was adorable. Today, they are pointing out how Mila was groomed and unfairly forced to do this. To make things even worse, Danny Masterson betting Ashton to put his tongue in her mouth for twenty dollars made them both seem extremely creepy. But it didn't stop there. In Mila's words, she was forced to kiss every man on the show. Oh. I'm worried about you on the show because you keep boy-hopping. 
What? Because I'm the whore in the show? I think so. I know. It's, a, it's upsetting to my parents as well. I Off camera, I know you're such a nice lady. Thank you're you. You're what, you're all of 19? Yes. Yeah. And and and, and you're you're in the show, though. You're, you're just... I'm the one who's kissed every single guy in the show, except for Tofu. That's so wrong, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's quite wrong. Yeah. And what do the writers, they just throw you... They don't care. They, no, they, they just... I don't know what they're thinking. I have no choice but you know, to just kiss every man on the show. Would... We have all heard the horrifying stories of Hollywood. If this is what she was forced to do on screen, what happened off screen? The first season of That 70s Show was a tremendous success, producing 25 episodes and averaging 11.7 million viewers. While some praised Ashton for his newfound fame, others resented him, claiming that he was mediocre and coasting off his natural good looks. But nobody resented him more than his twin brother, Michael. There was a moment where I viewed him as receiving more attention than I was, and that kind of drove me down to a place where I was jealous. Most people don't know about Ashton's twin brother, and after he watched Michael flatline on a hospital bed, his whole world flipped upside down. But first, a word from our sponsor, Rocket Money. Rocket Money is an all-in-one finance platform that helps you save more and spend less. The personal finance app allows you to manage subscriptions, lower bills, Diane delivered Michael. The doctors were immediately worried, because Michael only weighed four pounds. Diane didn't know at that time the lack of oxygen and complications with delivery would set her son up for a lifetime of complications. Michael was eventually diagnosed with a mild case of cerebral palsy, which affects his right side and vision. Cerebral palsy is a group of disorders that affect a person's ability to move and maintain balance and posture. CP is the most common motor disability in children. It is caused by abnormal brain development or damage to the developing brain, affecting a person's ability to control their muscles. The Kutcher family didn't realize how bad Michael's condition really was. Nobody in our family, nobody in our world was ever pointing out a difference between us. It just kind of felt like there's things that he's good at and there's things that I'm good at. Unfortunately for Michael, the kids at school were sure to let him know he was obviously different. Bullies would point out Michael's weak eyesight, hearing loss, and speech impediment. Ashton became Michael's protector. He wasn't going to let anyone bully his brother. In a lot of the times where we were playing soccer, and where maybe other kids would exclude me, he would always make sure that I was included. Michael even said that Ashton went so far as to only accept a sleepover invitation if his twin brother was invited too. Ashton felt guilty that his brother was suffering from this illness while he was totally normal. But in the 8th grade, things took a turn for the worse. Michael developed flu-like symptoms and doctors discovered that he had contracted viral myocarditis, resulting in an enlarged heart that needed a transplant. Michael was only given three or four weeks to live. Ashton stayed right by Michael's bedside the entire time, until one day, he flatlined. Ashton contemplated ending his own life since his heart would be a perfect match for his twin. He asked his parents to sacrifice him for Michael. Fortunately, Michael found a donor within 24 hours from an accident victim in another state and successfully received a heart transplant, ultimately saving his life. But his complications didn't end there. The family relocated to Homestead, Iowa, where Ashton attended Clear Creek Amana High School. Unfortunately, Michael later developed a blood clot and required open heart surgery. Ashton quickly realized he couldn't help his brother. He couldn't handle any more heartache and did whatever he could to distract himself. This is where he found his passion for acting in school plays, but he wasn't able to stay focused, which led to a pattern of delinquency. Ashton was convicted of third degree burglary and sentenced to three years of probation and 180 wow. hours of community service after trying to break into his high school after hours. When he went to the University of Iowa, he was kicked out of his apartment for being too noisy and wild. He was partying every night and often woke up many mornings not knowing what he had done the night before. However, it was on one of these drunken nights that he realized he had a gift. At the airliner bar in Iowa City, Iowa, a woman approached Ashton and asked if he had ever considered modeling. Ashton had nothing to lose, so he entered the Fresh Faces of Iowa modeling competition. To his surprise, he placed first and found an opportunity opportunity to be successful outside of traditional education. Mm. He traveled to New York City and participated in the International Modeling and Talent Association Convention, losing to Josh Duhamel. Despite lo uh, first thing I want to say just before I get into like uh, the rest of the video, but that main part right there well, look at this man, the writers. The writers forced a 14-year-old girl to kiss men that was older than her. And Ashton Kutcher was 19 at the time. She was 14. And you telling me the writers didn't find anything wrong with that? Like, come on. Man, I'm telling you, Hollywood would do anything for money. 
like she said, even her parents then was mad. Why did, if her parents were so upset, why didn't it, why didn't they stop her from their show? Why did they why did they didn't take her from their show? Take her off the show? Was it because the money she was getting, they was good with it? Like, come on. Then that's and then you telling me that this guy that they got locked up now, they just received 30 years that I'm hearing, would pay Ashton Kutcher ten dollars to French kiss a 14 year old girl? And he was 19 at the time. That's disgusting. He could have went to jail for that. But it, and and it's sad that the writers allowed it. The writers allowed it. They even wrote the script. Boy, 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 man. Losing, Ashton garnered attention from several modeling agencies. Standing at six foot two, he soon landed a modeling contract with Next Modeling Agency. He immediately dropped out of school and pursued this full time, becoming the face of Calvin Klein and a skateboarding company called Zoo York. But modeling was not his passion. He knew he was more than just a pretty face. After hearing about an audition for a comedy sitcom in LA, Ashton decided to take his chances. He auditioned for two roles on two different shows and landed them both. The first was a one hour TV drama about cowboy surfers. Ashton was desperate to make his dreams a reality, but he denied the role because it didn't feel right. That series became Wind on Water, a low-budget adventure canceled after six episodes. The second role he landed was Michael Kelso on that 70s show, which made him a superstar. Now, most people know Ashton to be kind of a one-dimensional actor. He landed a couple of minor supporting roles in romantic comedies early on, Coming Soon and Down to You, as well as the action crime thriller Reindeer Games. But he made his lead role debut as Jesse in Dude Where's my car, a stoner comedy about two friends who wake up after a night of partying, unable to remember where they left their car. Now this film was bound to be successful for Ashton, since it was written by that 70s show screenwriter and script editor Philip Stark, and the main character Jesse was basically the same as Kelso. Stark was familiar with Ashton's comedic timing and was able to construct the screenplay in a way that displayed his strengths. Critics hated the movie, saying it straight up wasn't funny, but that didn't matter. Dude Where's My Car was a box office success and grossed over $73 million worldwide on a $13 million budget. I also thought it was hilarious, but I was eight years old when I watched it. It was during this new peak of fame for Ashton that he would find himself being a witness to a murder, which changed the course of his life forever. Oh. The Hollywood Ripper was described as a serial sexual thrill killer who took the lives of multiple women throughout the 90s into the 2000s. One of those victims was Ashley Ellerin, who was a friend of Ashton's. On the night of February 21st, 2001, Ashton and Ashley had planned to go to the Grammys after party together. Around 8.24, he said he was running late. Around 8.30, witnesses said they heard screams from Ashley's house. Ashton said he arrived to her house much later, at 10.45 p.m. He knocked on the door, but heard nothing, thinking he was stood up, so he left without her. At 9 a.m. the next day, Ashley was discovered by her roommate dead on the floor. She was stabbed 47 times. Oh he immediately contacted the police the next day. He was freaked out because he knew his fingerprints would be on the doorknob, but he was not a suspect in this case. However, 20 years Years later, many people are questioning Ashton's involvement. In an Instagram story posted by Chrissy Bixler, the girlfriend of his co-star Danny Masterson, she wrote, Did you forget I was there? You were on speakerphone the night you called Danny on February 21st, 2001, which was the night of the murder. I heard everything. I heard the plan. In my opinion, you're just as sick as your mentor. Oh. However, this all happened in 2001 and went relatively unnoticed until recently. In 2000... Whoa, whoa. She said, do you forget? I heard y'all on the phone. You just as sick as your mentor, which is the man that just got locked up. <sighs> boy, 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 man. Nowadays, you just never know, man. You don't know what's true, what's false. And then, and <sighs> wow, that's all I got to say is wow. I, I'm kind of lost for words here. Three, Ashton co-starred with Brittany Murphy in Just Married, where he discovered that romantic comedies are where he thrives. The two young actors dated briefly after filming wrapped, and while it was a short-lived romance, their natural chemistry helped the movie become a commercial success, grossing over $100 million worldwide. Wow. But critics would not let up on Ashton. He was nominated for Worst Actor for all three of his 2003 films at the 24th Golden Raspberry Awards. He did step outside his comfort zone with The Butterfly Effect, a science fiction thriller where Evan Traborn 
experiences blackouts and can travel back in time to inhabit his younger self with his adult mind, trying to make small changes to reshape the future of his friends and family. This was a huge box office success, but again, critics destroyed it. It seemed like the only praise Ashton would get would be from young girls who thought he was a heartthrob. People couldn't fathom why he kept getting casted for new films, and that's likely because he was producing them himself. He started his own production company called Catalyst in 2000, alongside Jason Goldberg. At age 22, the young entrepreneur knew he could make way more money producing than just being an actor. However, during his next big TV venture, he almost destroyed his career. During the early 2000s, Catalyst and MTV mm. developed a program called Harassment. The initial plan was to create a hidden camera show which would feature pranks on regular everyday anonymous people. However, those plans were derailed in January 2002 following an incident that resulted in Ashton and MTV being sued for $10 million. James and Lori Ann Ryan took a holiday from their home in Washington, D.C. to Las Vegas, booking their stay at the Hard Rock Hotel. The couple entered their Las Vegas room and discovered what appeared to be a dead human body covered and surrounded by blood, evidently the victim of a homicide. Two actors posing as security guards blocked their exit, and another dressed as a paramedic went in before Ashton popped out and told them it was all part of a guerrilla-style candid camera show. The incident was being filmed as part of the pilot episode for Harassment. Unfortunately, yeah, see, that's the thing. You can't play like that, man. That's where we like, I, I see a lot of folks that do a lot of pranks and stuff on YouTube. You got to be, you, you have to be careful, man. I mean, pranks can lead to something very, very, very bad. It can. So that's why I don't really like to get into like pranks and stuff. I understand they can be funny at times, but some people out here in the real world don't play around and some people don't even know that you're pranking them. So, I mean, it can go from from good to worse in like a in like a millisecond. So you have to be careful. That's why I say pranks are really not that you know not good to do, depending on what kind of prank you're trying to pull. But overall pranks can can lead to bad things. So you have to be careful if you're a person that does pranks all the time. The couple, who just wanted to enjoy their vacation, were absolutely mortified and later sued MTV for $10 million. The couple claimed invasion of privacy, infliction of emotional distress, and fraud, among other things. The crazy part is, this wasn't even the first time MTV made this mistake. Eight months earlier, a pair of teenage girls sued MTV after they were sprayed with human excrement for the show Dude, This Sucks. MTV apologized and promised to never show the footage, but the lawsuit remained in litigation. Somehow, Ashton dodged a a bullet with this controversy, but MTV still trusted his vision for a prank show. They rebranded from harassment to punked and decided to prank celebrities instead of random people. Punked first aired in March 2003, I and the first episode it. saw Ashton target singer Justin Timberlake and Malcolm in the Middle star Frankie Muniz. For Justin, he was led to believe he owed $900,000 in taxes when government agents appeared to confiscate his house and valuables. Time magazine named the prank as number three in their list of 32 epic moments in reality TV history. Punked wasn't the first prank show ever created, but it certainly was the most popular one of that time. The second season secured 7.4 million viewers, a 55% increase over season 1. It was the most watched show in its time period among viewers 12 to 34. The pranks were decent, but it was the never-ending list of A-list celebrities that made it so popular. The Rock, Tyra Banks, Kanye West, Serena Williams, Dirk Nowitzki, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Simon Cowell, Allen Iverson, Tony Hawk, Akon, Shaquille O'Neal, Triple H, Sean Paul, Neo, Rihanna, Zac Efron, and John Cena. Basically everyone got punked. Yeah. The hardest part about the show was getting celebrities to sign the paperwork because they didn't want to be embarrassed in front of millions. We never aired a single episode that a celebrity didn't sign a waiver to say, it's okay to air this. Punked became a part of culture. In the early 2000s, people would often say, am I being punked right now? While something weird or crazy was happening in their lives. And then they look around in all various corners to wait for Ashton Kutcher to pop out with a camera in their face laughing. There was one clip of punked that resurfaced recently of Ashton talking about pranking Hilary Duff, the Lizzie McGuire superstar who at the time was 15 years old. Hillary Joff is in Lizzie McGuire. She also has an album out. Um, she's going to be in a movie called Cheaper by the Dozen. And she's one of the girls that we're all waiting for to turn 18 along with the Olsen twins. Many people say this is just the way people joked in the early 2000s, but others claim this was actually Ashton's sick mindset. Ashton was lucky to star in two extremely Yeah, that was kind of creepy though. Like, uh, we all waiting on her to turn 18. Like, something that, that right there is like, uh, what do you mean that, that we all are waiting for her to turn 18? 
And then you see the reason why, like, a lot of fans and stuff had problems with Ashton, like I said, back then in the early 2000s. Because, you know, statements like that. Many people say this is just the way people joked in the early 2000s, but others claim this was actually Ashton's sick mindset. Ashton was lucky to star in two extremely successful shows at once, but the first one was about to come crashing down. He was making between 250000 and 300000 per episode of that 70s show, adding up to as much as $8 million per season. Topher Grace left the show once the series concluded its seventh season. Fans felt that it wasn't the same without such a central character in the series. Ashton also left the show to explore new opportunities as an actor and producer. Without Topher and Ashton, the show's last season only drew 6 million viewers, a 5 million viewer decline compared to the first season. From here, the only time Ashton saw success is when he played the role of the dumb hot guy. From 2006 to 2014, he starred in 13 films, but failed to have any kind of substantial impact outside of romantic comedies. His first project after that 70s show was about Robert Kennedy's assassination titled Bobby. Despite a star-studded cast, the actors seemed more like very special guest stars than real 1968 vintage Americans. Bobby was just average and struggled to achieve box office success. Despite prominent roles in The Guardian, Open Season, What Happens in Vegas, these films just added to Ashton's list of below average films that did well at the box office. Spread, Personal Effects, and Brothers Justice was a three-peat run of low-budget indie films that all received bad reviews and no commercial mm. success. Following a forgettable role in Valentine's Day, Ashton found himself opposite Katherine Heigl in the 2010 action comedy Killers. It received negative reviews from critics and only grossed $98 million against a $75 million budget, and with his film career on the ropes, he accepted yet another rom-com. No Strings Attached with Natalie Portman. The film was adored by fans and grossed over $149 million worldwide. But what fans adored even more was Hollywood's newest power couple, Mila Kunis and Ashton Kutcher. Ashton ended his marriage with his then-wife, Demi Moore. Ashton and Demi met in 2003 when Ashton was 25 years old and Demi was 40. Their relationship quickly made headlines as an unexpected 40? couple with their 15-year age gap. Demi already had three daughters from a previous marriage to actor Bruce Willis. Following months of negative reports about Ashton's alleged infidelity, Ashton and Demi both decided it was time for a divorce. However, still to this day, he remains a father figure to her children. I make a conscious effort to stay in touch with the girls. I love them, and I'm never going to stop loving them, right? And respecting them and honoring them and rooting for them to be successful in whatever they're pursuing. A lot of men, especially A-list celebrities, mm -hmm. would not keep in touch with their ex-stepchildren after a divorce. But That's exactly right, though. So, I, I mean, you got to give them props for that right there. Still want to stay in touch. You know what I'm saying? Still want to be able to, you know, talk to the girls, make sure they all right. Can't be mad at the man for that right there. But, dang, he was with, like, 25. She was 40. Man. Once he reunited with Mila Kunis, that 70s show fans' dreams came true. Sometimes life imitates art. On top of that, Ashton made a winning return to television in 2011, replacing Charlie Sheen on Two and a Half Men after Sheen's antics got him booted off the hit sitcom. Kutcher fit in as yet again the idiotic, handsome womanizer, but ratings rapidly declined until it was ultimately canceled. It didn't really matter though, because Ashton was the highest paid actor on television for four years, according to Forbes, making upwards of $700,000 per episode. Hey. He specialized in acting like an idiot, but in real life, he is far from it. Because his hundreds of millions in net worth is due to him being an early investor in some of the largest corporations today. Airbnb, Pinterest, Shazam, Skype, Spotify, Warby Parker, and Uber all received some investment money from the actor. One of his top executives at Catalyst, Sarah Ross, began introducing him to Silicon Valley elites during the early 2000s. I spent 90% of my time just listening, says Kutcher. Ashton used his celebrity status to break into Silicon Valley and begin investing before it was a cool thing to do. As you can imagine, he made a fortune. In 2010, Ashton teamed up with music executive Gary Osiri and investor Ron Burkle, founding A-Grade Investments. In 2016, Forbes noted that the group turned their $30 million fund into a cool $250 million mm. in just a six-year period. Throughout the 2010s, you would see him at tech conferences and on business news networks talking about money instead of movies. But as you learn more about what he does with his money, you realize he is not like your typical capitalist. Ashton spends a ton of his dollars and time to ending suffering around the world. 
Ashton made considerable efforts to raise money for Habitat for Humanity, Girls Educational and Mentoring Services, okay. Boys and Girls Clubs of America, Raising Malawi, United Nations Children's Fund, St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, Stand Up to Cancer, among others. In March of 2022, Ashton and Mila helped raise over $30 million for Ukrainians after Russia invaded their country. However, his most profound effort that you almost never hear about is his foundation to stop child sex trafficking, Thorn, Digital Defenders of Children. The nonprofit builds software given to law enforcement for free to identify victims of sex trafficking and the people participating. And uh, like I said before, though, we all do messed up stuff as uh, young kids and then we grow. But I, I mean, come on, I think anybody uh, back then wouldn't have did nothing like that. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like kissing a 14 year old girl, it's like stuff like that. I'm like, bro. And I think like they together today now. I think that's his uh, wife now. But man, but like I said, he he doing a great job now, you know what I'm saying? Like with the donations that he does with his money and stuff. Cause you got a lot of actors that, that don't even do that, don't even give back. They just buy stupid stuff, cars, rims, you know, just just buying stuff that don't matter. Participating in the sale and exploitation of children. Ashton has been devoted to this cause for over a decade, and his efforts through Thorn are making a difference. Mm. The 2021 impact report from Thorn shows their software, Spotlight, identified 3,977 victims in 2021 and 24,366 during the lifetime of the software. Over 2,700 law enforcement agencies are now using the technology provided by Thorn. The work Thorn is doing helps protect children from their abusers and removes mm. damaging content from the internet. Ashton is the co-founder and chairperson of Thorn. In 2017, Ashton testified on Capitol Hill about child sex trafficking. The things he said in this testimony are sickening, but they need to be heard so people can address the disgusting reality of what goes on in this world. I've been on FBI raids where I've seen things that no person should ever see. I've seen video content of a child that's the same age as mine being by an American man that was a sex tourist in Cambodia. And this child was so conditioned by her environment that she thought she was engaging in play. Ashton claims that it would typically take mm. years for federal agents to identify and capture a trafficker, but his software is able to do it in just three weeks. And in some cases, he has identified and rescued victims within just three days. He asked wow. Congress for, of course, money to build more infrastructure around this, but also he wanted to create a government initiative to end human trafficking. However, we don't know if his testimony mobilized any government programs. We do know that he hasn't given up. In 2022, he raised more than $1 million for Thorne while running the New York City Marathon. And to this day, Thorne has a team of 100 employees using technology to defend children from sexual abuse. However, just recently, Ashton and Mila have said things that make us question everything we thought we knew about them. Danny Masterson, their co-star on That 70s Show, was accused, tried, and found guilty of R-wording two victims. Masterson was accused in 2017 by five different women claiming he assaulted them in the early 2000s. Three of the five victims were Scientologists, a church that he has been a part of since he was a child. Masterson assured everyone that these claims were false and he was a victim of jealous women who feel empowered by the Me Too movement. However, the court did not see it that way. The trial began in October of 2022, and the testimonies were horrifying. Multiple victims testified how brutal and forceful Masterson was. One of his victims was his longtime girlfriend, Chrissy Bixler. In May of 2023, Masterson was found guilty of R-wording two women in 2003. But in a strange turn of events, Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis each sent the judge a letter asking for leniency in Masterson's sentencing. And in Ashton's letter, he describes his now guilty friend as an extraordinarily honest and intentional human being, and a role model. He ends the letter with, While I'm aware that the judgment has been cast as guilty on two counts of by force and the victims have a great desire for justice. I hope that my testament to his character is taken into consideration in sentencing. I do not believe he is an ongoing harm to society and having his daughter raised without a present father would be a tertiary injustice in and of itself. See, and that right there is why he, uh, Ashton them got called out. Ashton Kutcher and his wife got called out for that, trying to take up for a person that did something that disgusting to women back in the days. And now Ashton Kutcher don't want to take that back and like, oh, well, we apologize for what we said about that letter after the judge gave him 30 years. That's why everybody is pissed off at Ashton Kutcher right now and Mila.
That's the reason why. You can't take up for nobody who done did something that disgusting to women, took control of a woman like that. And not just one, multiple. Despite Ashton and Mila's attempts, the judge sentenced Danny Masterson to 30 years in prison for his crimes. Ashton's statement completely changed everything we thought we knew about him. He dedicated the past 10 years fighting against human trafficking, being a first-hand witness yep. on multiple occasions to arguably the worst type of crime in human existence, and being a part of rescuing these victims and trying to give them a fair chance at life again, only to contradict everything he stands for when his co-star committed the exact crimes he is fighting against. Exactly. Then to defend his character and say that him being in jail would be an injustice Justice. This one statement destroyed Ashton's credibility forever. Once the letters leaked onto the internet, they apologized. We are aware of the pain that has been caused by the character letters that we wrote on behalf of Danny Masterson. We support victims. We have done this historically through our work and will continue to do so in the future. A couple months ago, Danny's family reached out to us and they asked us, to write character letters to represent the person that we knew for 25 years so that the judge could take that into full consideration relative to the sentencing. The letters were not written to question the legitimacy of the judicial system or the validity of the jury's ruling. They were intended for the judge to read um, and not to undermine the testimony of the victims or re-traumatize them in any way. We would never want to do that. And we're sorry if that has taken place. Our heart goes out to every single person who's ever been a victim of sexual assault, sexual abuse. This robotic and cold apology did not help anyone understand so why they sent these letters. And this Yeah, that's the thing though. <laughs> that's the thing, like why would you send some letters like that if you know that he did that? And talking about, well, we weren't saying it, we, we didn't send it because of this or because of that. You signed it because you didn't want him to go to prison entire situation makes people regret celebrating Ashton Kutcher for the past 25 years. Wow, there you go, man. Another great video uh, by Patrick. Like I said, shout out to Patrick for this. Like I said, I will leave the original video link in the description. Uh, that way y'all can go watch it. Let him know I sent you over there. He does a great job with the videos. So like I said, salute. Shout out to Patrick, man. But uh, like I said, y'all get in the comment section. Let me know what y'all think about all of this. Obviously, y'all heard what I have to say. It was a lot to unpack. Long video, but we got through it. Uh, like I said, appreciate you all for watching, and I'll catch y'all in the next one.